The reading this morning is going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6 and going through chapter 3, verse 4. That's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 through chapter 3, verse 4. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, the, received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Thank you, Daniel. Hey, good morning, everybody. we got a lot of visitors. We're, we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, some of you from out of town. I don't know if you're sticking around or not, but if you are, um, hope you enjoy North Alabama. We'd love to help you enjoy it. And if you're not, maybe we'll grant you safety in your travels back home. The connect cards that John was talking about are in your black folders if you're visiting. So if you get a chance, um, you can fill those out. If you didn't put them in the collection basket, we'll take them at the end of service too. So in case you're wondering, what's a connect card? That's what a connect card is, and that's where they're located in that, in that black folder. Before I say anything else, let's, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your spirit, your spirit that teaches us that opens to us your mystery, the mystery of your wisdom revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would give us a full measure of your spirit this morning to understand the things that were written by men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit and preserved for thousands and thousands of years for our good and for our hope and for our glory and for your glory. Thank you for your word, God. May it build us up. May it equip us for every good work. And Holy Spirit, would you please minister to us this morning as I speak? Minister to me as I speak. Teach us the mind of Christ. Make us more Christ-like. Help us not to be puffed up with conceit, thinking more of ourselves than we should think, but help us to have a humble demeanor in all humility count the needs of others as more pressing and important than our own needs God we know that you'll answer this prayer we want Christ to loom large in our minds and in our hearts and I pray Holy Spirit that you would do that for us now I pray this in Jesus name amen so here's the main point of the sermon all right this is the main point we'll say it in two different ways and I think it's kind of the main point of Paul's thought process here in context wisdom all right wisdom from above renders what it reveals or to say it differently wisdom produces what it portrays in other words wisdom is not ineffectual all right it's not just something that you can grasp and have and say all right well I have I have wisdom wisdom from a biblical perspective whether it's godly or worldly produces something Worldly wisdom produces worldliness. Godly wisdom produces godliness. I think that's Paul's 
point here. Um, the Corinthians think that they have arrived. If you were to ask them, they would say, we have the mind of Jesus Christ, not of the world. We know this because of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10. He's writing with a little bit of a bite of sarcasm where he, when he says, We are fools, so apostles, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. You guys got it all figured out, so much so that you think that we are foolish. So they think they arrived, and the question we ask is, have they? Have they arrived? Have we arrived? Are they mature? Are they, do they possess the mind of Christ? Are we mature? Do we possess the mind of Christ? What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? What is it? Do we have it? That's what we're going to look at this morning. But if you look, verses 6 through 16, you get a couple of twos in here, right? So this sermon is outlined two, 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 one, two. All right, so, and some of you heard this last week. But when we read this, we first, we see first two types of wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it is, not, it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. So there's the first type of wisdom. That's why I say that there's a worldly wisdom. There is a worldly wisdom that informs the way all of us live in this world. All of us are products of worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom has taught you how to act, how to think, how to be a consumer, how to spend your money, how to save your money, how to invest, how to deal with food, how to deal with sex, how to deal in marriage. Every one of us have consumed human wisdom, and it's impacted us. So that's the first type of wisdom. It's human wisdom, wisdom of the age, according to the rules of this age. Here's the second type. Verse 7, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. This is why it is so stinking difficult to live the Christian life. It's because Christians are products of two wisdoms. You have the wisdom of this world that you learned your entire life. And then you come to Christ and you receive godly wisdom through the Spirit and you come to find out the things that you learn from the world were rubbish. And you have to learn as an adult how to live in this world in a way that's completely foreign to the way you learned it when you were a youngster. That's what makes it difficult because we're dealing with two types of wisdom. And there are two types of teachers, two different teachers. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 13. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So according to Paul, there is a spirit of this world, all right? A ruler of this world is what Jesus calls Satan. And he spits out his own kind of wisdom, all right? He, he smacks the marching drum, the bass drum of worldly wisdom, and people of the world just go right along with it. All right, that's the first teacher. The second teacher is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the world uses wisdom words, words that accord with the way we live. The Spirit of God uses words that are Spirit-empowered. Right Now, we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, there's worldly wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who, who are spiritual. So we got two wisdoms, two teachers, and then two messages. The Spirit, when He comes and teaches you hidden wisdom in your heart, the content of that wisdom is Jesus Christ. We know that because of what it says in verse 7. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this kind of wisdom. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things, the things that God prepared beforehand, all that we are and what we will be in the person of Jesus Christ, 
Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his second coming, all these things that have been revealed, right? God revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So when the Spirit went diving into God himself, right? My speaking, my language, language breaks down here because we're talking about one God in three persons. So when the person of the Spirit dives to the depths of God's wisdom and his mystery and his knowledge, he comes up holding the jewel of Jesus Christ. There is no greater wisdom. There is no greater mystery. There is no greater glory than Jesus Christ. He is what the Spirit unveils from the depths of God's wisdom. That's what's revealed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says as much, John 16, 14. He says, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will glorify me. That is what the Spirit does. He takes Jesus Christ and makes him look irresistibly beautiful and wonderful and life-giving and trustworthy and praiseworthy to the otherwise fallen human heart who could give two rips about Jesus Christ before the Spirit does his work. And if you're in Christ, you've experienced that. You didn't care about Jesus. You didn't care what he said. And you sure did not care what he did. But when the Spirit comes, he takes what the world sees as foolishness, this weak, lowly, meek Savior, and he makes him the apple of your eye. That's what we call conversion when that happens. So that's the message of the Holy Spirit. Christ, the Lord of glory. And the spirit of the world, his message is everything that is in opposition to Jesus Christ. That's what he does. That's the only thing that he does. He puts things in your life and puts you in situations that threaten your love for Jesus Christ. He says, look at this new shiny thing I got. It's like, it's like Erica's shirt. Shiny. And I said, oh, I really like that shiny shirt. When we forsake Christ, we run after the shirt. Worldly wisdom is so opposed to God's glory that you, this is worldly wisdom. You can get joy, satisfaction, contentment, relief from what this world has to offer. I will be your God. You don't need that one. That's worldly wisdom in a nutshell. Worldly wisdom is so opposed to God's glory, the, resurre- the crucified Jesus Christ, that when it shows up making claims to be for our good and our glory, it crucifies it, literally. If the rulers of this age had understood this, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. So we've got two wisdoms, two teachers, two messages, and now two types of students. And they're grouped separately here. So the first type of student that we read about is the mature one. Verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. And that's contrasted with infants. Chapter 3, verse 1. But our brothers cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ Jesus. So... There they are. You have mature people and you have infants. They kind of bookend this section here. Or to say it another way, you have spiritual people and natural people. So here's spiritual, chapter 2, verse 13. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Verse 15. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Chapter 3 and verse 1. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people. All right, so there's the first classification. A mature person, or to say it differently, a spiritually minded person. Here's the second one. Natural. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. Chapter 3, verse 3. For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, 
Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So you have mature spiritual students, okay? And then you have infants or naturally minded fleshly people. So there's two types of students. And these two types of students are going to be given one test. One test. And it's necessary. Here's why it's necessary. We're not talking about a believer and an unbeliever in this text. We know this because he says, I cannot address you as spiritual people, but as fleshly people, comma, as infants in Christ. So those two prepositional phrases are in what we call apposition to one another. In other words, it describes a fleshly person. What is a fleshly person in this context? An infant in Christ Jesus. So it's a Christian. He's talking to a Christian. And in so doing, right, in having to actually classify these people who've been born of the Holy Spirit as some being spiritual and some fleshly, he confronts a sobering reality that exists in every single church. Because of the nature of the Spirit's role in declaring Christ, and because of the church's vital union with Jesus Christ by faith, the church should be a people among whom the Spirit abounds. This place and you guys, we should be eat up with the Holy Spirit. He should be oozing out of our eyeballs and ears and nostrils and mouths and fingertips. We are a thin place. We should be. But usually she isn't. The church should be filled and permeated with the Holy Spirit, but usually she isn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants of Christ. Lots of flesh. Little bitty, 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 bitty bit of spirit. Kind of like the physical makeup of this church, right? Lots of babies! Like three or four to a person. And few adults. We fly Christ's banner, put his name on our buildings, signs, billboards, and in our bathrooms and bedrooms, thanks to Hobby Lobby. But we don't have him in our heads. So this is the test. This is the test. The mature have the mind of Christ. Do we have it? Are we mature in Christ Jesus? How do I know? And what does it mean to have the mind of Jesus Christ? And this is what we're going to finish the sermon with. The last two. All right. There are two properties of the mature regarding Christ. Wisdom, okay? There's there's more than two, but there are only two we're going to talk about. Two. Two pretty good litmus tests to, okay, do I have the mind of Christ? What does it mean do I have it? And here they are. The mature person regarding wisdom insists on the supremacy of Christ philosophically, and the mature person insists on the love of Christ practically. So the mature person insists on two things. A philosophy of Jesus and a practical outworking of Jesus in his relationship with others. And I want to show you why I say that. The mature person insists on the supremacy of Christ philosophically. Or in other words, a mature person insists, insists, insists. In the face of a thousand different worldviews, that the Christian worldview is best and supreme. They insist upon it. And here's why I say that. So turn to Colossians chapter 2, where Paul uses the word mature, all right? And I think it's going to be posted for you. Colossians 2, um, I'm sorry, Colossians 1, verses 27 through 29, that's where we're going to start. Listen to what Paul says. He says, To them, the Gentiles, 
God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ Jesus. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. He wants to impart wisdom for the purpose of people being mature. Chapter 2, verse 2. He wants to share the struggle he's had at Laodicea, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now look at what he says in verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. He says, the reason I proclaim Christ so much is so that no one may delude your thinking with plausible arguments that subtly manifest and exalt themselves against Jesus Christ. Now let's go to verse 8 of chapter 2. Ready? He says... Well, let's start. I'm going to read you verse 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Be rooted in Christ, established in Christ. And here's why. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition. This is wisdom of the world according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. That's why I say that worldly wisdom is demonic in nature and Satan beats on the drum of worldly wisdom and everybody that's taught by the world follows that. He is the originator and the perpetrator of worldly wisdom. So don't go after that philosophy. It doesn't accord with Christ. That's what is at the end of verse 8. Verse 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him. Through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we are connected by faith, symbolized through baptism and other things, to this Glorious Jesus Christ who is rule over every authority and principality and power. In other words, he's saying, why would you follow worldly wisdom that's demonic in origin when you've been connected to the ruler of all demons? You've been connected by faith to the one when he speaks, demons tremble. Why follow a demonic teaching? Why be subject to slavery when you are connected to the owner of all reality by faith in Jesus Christ? And this is what he says in verse 15. God disarmed the rulers and the authorities. He disarmed Satan, defamed him, declawed him, made an open mockery of him. And put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Why follow their teaching? And this is what he says in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. In other words, if people want to impose a dietary law on you for holiness... You don't let anybody pass judgment on you. If somebody sees you out 
and you're having a beer, and somebody says, that's a sin. You don't, that, that is not declarative judgment on your wrong, like drinking alcohol is a sin. It's not. That's legalism. I want to control and manipulate. It's not freedom in Christ. Or bacon, if you were Muslim. Like pork, dietary regulations. Or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. See, these are all worldly philosophies. You celebrate the right holidays? Do you eat the right food? Do you drink the right drink? Are you right? Are you right? Do you do the right things? Godly wisdom in the face of these demands does what? Insist on... Anybody listening besides me? Jesus Christ! This is what Paul does next. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That's what mature Christians do. They, in, they insist on Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. Oh, I got carried up to the fourth heaven this morning. I saw things no human being should see. I heard things uttered no human being should hear. It's been sealed. I can't tell you. Look at how spiritual I am. If you were more spiritual, you'd have these visions. Or if you were more spiritual, you'd speak in tongues. It sounds religious. It sounds spiritual. But Paul says the mature Christians hold these things at an arm's length. And instead they insist on Christ. And not holding fast, verse 19, to the head. From whom the whole body, nourishing it together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Why is if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. This is a kicker. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self made religion and asceticism and severity to the body but are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Mature people who have the mind of Christ insist on Christ in the face of every single worldview. Whether it's openly lawless or concealed legalism. It does not matter. We do not mature in Christ in order to move on. From Christ. We mature in Christ to go deeper into Christ. Phrases like from faith to faith, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. All these phrases point or speak to the truth that the starting point in Christianity is, in fact, its end point Christ. That, that is it. You never outmature him or outgrow him. We're desperately needy of him. And when we mature in Christ, we don't go away from the things of Christ. We go deeper into the things of Christ. So, the first property of the mature regarding wisdom, wisdom is that they insist on the supremacy of Christ philosophically. And... Second, they insist on the supremacy of Christ practically. And there's not, a, there's not a disconnect there. 
what we think philosophically should inform and create what we do practically. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Let me think about that. But think about what Paul said. We have the mind of Christ. What a mind to have. A mind so powerful that he could bring into existence and create a thousand possible worlds at any moment, at any time. And they exist in actuality because they exist in his mind. That kind of mind power. And know every possible Solution to every possible problem and every certain circumstance that would create the vast array of problems that would require an answer. If one person chose this instead of that, that kind of mind. But, as fun as it would be to have that kind of mind, maybe. When Paul speaks about the mind of Christ in other places, it's not nearly as mind-blowing. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 8. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, this is verse 3, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not Look, not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In other words, Having the mind of Christ is just as much sanctification as it is revelation. Having the mind of Christ is not necessarily having something revealed to you that's new as much as it is having yourself conformed to something that's old. Like humility and submission and love. And it's just as much practical as it is philosophical, right? So James 3, verses 13 through 18. A lot of people don't think James and Paul agree with one another. Martin Luther did not. In his Bible, he removes the epistle of James. Calls it an epistle full of straw. But they agree here. James 3.13, who's wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. The wisdom from above is first, and you would expect content, right? Right? The wisdom from above is first, this is what Daniel 3 means. Or this is when the Lord's coming back. But wisdom from above isn't described in terms of content. It's described in terms of character. Peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere. That shows how far off we are as humans. We don't even have the right definition of wisdom. We think, it in, we think of it in terms of content. Tell me something I don't know. When God speaks of wisdom, it, it involves what we are. 
or what we should be. So, two properties of the mature. They insist on the supremacy of Christ philosophically, and they insist on the supremacy of Christ practically. And we end with answering this question. Are the Corinthians wise in Christ? As Paul says, so tongue-in-cheek in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> You're wise in Christ. We're fools. Well, do they insist on the supremacy of Christ practically? Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For why there is jealousy and strife among you. Remember James 3? Those are demonic qualities of wisdom. You are you not of the flesh, and behaving only in a human way. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? So, eh, they're not. They don't insist on the supremacy of Christ practically. They don't love each other. They don't bear the fruits of the wisdom from above. They're bearing the fruit of the wisdom of the world. Demonic, rivalries, backbiting, slander, frauding one another, as we're going to see in chapter 6. What about the second one? Do they insist on Christ philosophically? This is verses 18 through 23 of chapter 3, the very end of the chapter. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So that's what we're talking about. We, we don't understand wisdom. We think of it in terms of content, not character. And Paul says, if you want to be wise, you got to be foolish to the wisdom of the world. It doesn't work the same. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future... All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God. So they don't hold to the supremacy of Christ philosophically either. They boast in men when they should be boasting in God. And they bear the fruits from that it comes from wisdom from below and not from wisdom from above. Their misunderstanding of the supremacy of Jesus Christ fuels their division. Every problem in the Corinthian church and at the Way Church and at Lindsay Lane Baptist Church and at First United Methodist Church or wherever the church worships, the main problem in every church is that its people do not fully grasp the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Because if they did, they wouldn't act the way they act. Churches are lots of flesh and little bitty, 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 bitty spirit. Which is why we proclaim Christ. We proclaim Christ so that we might grow in maturity in Christ Jesus. So they failed the test, and the question is what about us? What about me? What about you? I think we all do a little bit, right? So, by way of application, what are i got three applications, things we could do to grow in this. And here's the first one. Pray. Pray, 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 pray. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. That is the first solution to getting wisdom. Pray. Ask God. To give it to you. Ask him to teach you how to live and how to be in this world. Ask him to kill the old you, the old habits, the old desires that inform your way of thinking. Because they're there. Pray for wisdom and pray for a change of will. John 7, 17. If anyone's will is to do God's will, then he will know whether or not my teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. 
You catch the significance of that? You know what people need before they need more teaching? A change in their will. If anyone's will is to do God's will, then he will know. So uh, we think it's the opposite. Tell me and I'll decide. Will changed. It's not the way it works. God has to move and change you in order for you to know the things of God. Because apart from God, we're a flesh. Fleshly people don't understand spiritual reality. They are, it's, it's foreign to them. Something has to happen to make a natural person like me a spiritual one. And so pray for wisdom and pray that God would change your will so that you could receive and know Jesus' teaching. Here's the second thing. Swim deep in the ocean of Christ's glory. Right? The massive spiritual change that we need comes from meditating on very, very small truths. Have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 3-7. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't count his equal status with God as something that he needed to hold on to to keep him from emptying himself. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. You can actually, if you wanted to, get a little note card, all right? Say, I want to grow in Christ's likeness, and write down these questions. Is this from selfish ambition or conceit? Do I count my spouse's more significant, my spouse more significant than myself, or my coworker more significant than myself? Is the way I am acting in this conversation, in this interaction, does it portray that I'm important or that they're important? Have I looked out for someone else's interest today? It's, that's, that's wisdom from above. And the reason it is because that's what Christ does. The most important person in existence walks around relatively, right, unknown by today's standards. There are YouTube preachers that are better known than Jesus Christ was. The most important person in history is treated as the least important. He could have made, he made the ground that holds us up. And with a word could swallow us whole. And he made no demands. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You can't get any higher than Jesus Christ. And you really can't get any lower than us. And that's what he became. Us. And if you want to get down to it, worse than us. Donald Trump is treated like a king in comparison to the way Jesus Christ was treated. That's the mind of Christ, though. It doesn't look at its status and says, people should treat me according to my status. Or it doesn't look what it has and says, people should treat me in accordance to what I have. And it doesn't look at other people's status and say, well, I should treat, I should treat J.D. because of what J.D. is. Or I should, what, what governs the way I relate to Darren is what Darren has. That's not the mind of Christ. It doesn't look at those things. It's blind to those things. So the last one is look upward instead of outward or inward. Preference for a preacher or a vacuum cleaner reveals a consumer mentality rather than a servant's mentality. And that's the issue here. 
I mean, it doesn't look like pride because they're boasting in men. But they're boasting in men who suit their own tastes. So even though it looks like Paul is king and Apollos is king and Cephas is king, the only thing king in the Corinthian church is what they want. Selfishness. I prefer this. I make a stink if I don't get what I want. And we're told, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you've been crucified with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. And that's what the Corinthians need. They need an outward view of their risen Savior instead of an inward view of what they want and an outward view of the people that give them what they want. Pray for a change of will. Pray for wisdom. Swim deep in the ocean of Christ's glory and look upward instead of outward. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you teach us spirit. You teach us by the power of your spirit wisdom. You teach us how to relate to one another. You teach us how to be servants, no matter what we have. You teach us how to disregard status in our relationships with others and in our expectations on how we should be treated by others. Christ, in you are literally hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And I pray, oh Spirit, that you would grant us strength in our inner person. That you would unite our hearts together by faith. That we might be able to receive and to comprehend just a little bit of the incomprehensible height and depth and breadth and width of your love for us in Christ Jesus. I pray for our church that we would let this mind be in us, which is ours in Christ Jesus. Who, though being in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But rather emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. He was obedient unto death. Help us to have that mind. We want to be people of spirit-empowered character, love, grace, reasonableness, patience, self-control. Help us to bear the fruit of the Spirit by the power of the Spirit. Help us to mature in Christ so that we can go deeper into Christ, Lord. Forgive us for acting like babies instead of grown men and women. But I pray now for those who are not Christians. What a glorious gift. God, we stand guilty before you. We stand guilty because we love movies more than you. And we love video games more than you. And we love food more than you. And we love sex more than you. We love in a moment a thousand different things more than we love you. And loving one, just one, is enough to where we stand guilty. Condemned. Except for one thing. Christ Jesus. Who's born under the law. Born of woman. Redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us. As it is written. Cursed is everyone. Who hangs on a tree. 
He's our only hope. Forgiveness of sins is declared to us in his name and his name only. And so I pray, Lord, that you would grant those here, not yours, repentance and forgiveness of their sins. And may they trust and they love the name of our crucified yet resurrected, ascended and reigning and one day come again descending Savior, Christ Jesus. We pray that you would do this now according to the goodness of your pleasure and your goodwill. Pray all this in Christ's name.